Good evening, everybody. And I'd like you to welcome you to our first of our three spring Let's Talk Organic webinars. And this, this evening, the focus is going to be on establishing regular swords. So without further ado, the first focus, we were going to take a look at the at a farmer's experience on establishing red clover. And we we're going to have Michael Edgeworth. Unfortunately, due to very unforeseen circumstances, Michael is unable to join us this evening. However, stepping into his shoes is his Chagas Organic Advisor, Carl. Carl McCauley. How are you, Carl? Good, Elaine. Yeah, thank you. OK, well, I, you're going to pretend that you're Michael now for the next couple of minutes and maybe just by way before we show the video that you both did last October, maybe give us some a bit of background in relation to Michael and Anne. Uh, what type of farming are they involved? Yeah, in? so um, Michael and Anne are, are involved in uh, the production of pedigree Angus uh, cattle and also the, the production of commercial sheep with, with a small number of pedigree Vendine sheep. Now that would have changed over the last five years from a focus on on more commercial type and continental type cattle to 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 the more um, Angus type pedigree type Angus cattle over the last uh, number of years, and that's primarily down to to for to financial reasons, as Michael has has said himself. Very good, and maybe more importantly, where are they located? We forgot to say that. Where are the base? Yeah, so they're they're farming. The, this this webinar will focus on the farm in in Bohe, which is in South Leitrim. And for anyone on the call that that's familiar with the area, that's uh, midway between Drumlish and Mohol. Um, they're all they're also farming in Wicklow and Kildare. But as I said, this this webinar will focus on the farm in in, in Leitrim. And I suppose maybe another question maybe is people that are maybe that are listening are not, are might be thinking about joining organics. Maybe why did um, why did um, Michael and Anne convert to organics? Yeah, well, that was part of what we, we we done on the video with him last October. Now we won't be showing that particular part tonight, but um, Michael kind of split his his answer that he gave us on that day into into two two elements, and the first of that being for for economic reasons. Um. He places a big fo focus on on costs versus versus and the return of them costs and as he said himself the, the the margin between the costs and the return return was just getting smaller and smaller so he done a sort of a um a, a small background bit of research into organics and he figured that actually he could reduce his input costs on the farm while also maintaining the output of the top quality pedigree Angus cattle. And, and the commercial sheep on the farm and, and overall reduces costs without having a major impact on, on the production on the farm. And I suppose yeah, secondly very valid then... reasons that make a lot of sense, yeah. yeah. Just, sorry, Elaine, just secondly, I suppose that there's a huge focus out there in relation to the environment at the moment. And and he did make a, a comment yes. that, you know, he, he, ha he has a, a big environmental focus on the farm as well at the moment. Okay, so it was a big picture view he took on it. Very good. Yeah. And maybe just before we show the video, um, as we say, we're focusing on, on growing red clover. As a farmer, why did Michael start growing red clover? Yeah, so I suppose just a bit of background in relation to the the, the Leitrim farm is 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 a relatively heavy farm. In fact, I suppose probably very heavy. In if 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 red clover can grow on the on, on this particular farm in Leitrim, it can probably almost grow on any farm. Um, I suppose the reason why he decided to try and grow it on this farm is that, for that particular reason, it doesn't it doesn't particularly suit the 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 grazing of heavy livestock at any stage of the year, apart from maybe for a few months in the summer. So, he decided that if he could establish a a red clover silage crop on it and cut it twice to three times a year, and avoid grazing it with heavy livestock, and focus the the grazing of maybe lighter lambs in the back end of the year. That that was probably the best use of of this particular farm land. Um. Secondly, there's good housing on this particular farm, and he thought if he could make the silage on this farm and house the cattle over the winter, and he'd have the farmyard manure and slurry there for for putting back out on the red clover ground then in the in the spring and and autumn time of the year. And I suppose thirdly, then just as a, as a as a top quality uh, uh, feed source for the the the, the livestock. Um, I suppose you know we all know the value of of red clover silage at this stage, and and yeah. having gone into to organics, he seen that there was going to be a huge benefit in trying to produce that top quality silage, and having to use um 
no chemical inputs, which obviously you can't use in an organic system. Okay, very good. Okay, Carl, we might leave it at that. And what I'll say to people is uh, put put questions into the question and answer function. And whenever all speakers are finished, we'll we'll have a session after after that. So maybe I guess uh, show the video there. I'll get Martin there to roll the video of yourself and Michael going through his steps that he took establishing the red clover swords and how he got on. Okay, Michael, so we're standing in the field here that, that was direct drilled with the red clover back in, in June. So can you just give us a, a bit of detail out of, out of what exactly happened in this field at so on time, please? Yeah, this field here and the field across from it, um, we took a cut of silage off on the first week in June. You might remember June came a very, very dry month, very good weather in the first week. There wasn't a huge crop of grass on it because the early spring growth wasn't brilliant, but we decided to take cut off it anyway um, with the intention of uh, reseeding it at some point. So when the silage was taken off it, we then spread farmyard manure on it. And following the farmyard manure, there was a, a, a fairly instant growth of grass through it. So we decided we needed to, to get that under control. So we went out with a mulcher and we mulched the whole thing. And that had the effect of cutting back on the grass and it also had the effect of uh, breaking down the manure that had gone out on it. Um, and then we brought in a, a direct drill and direct drilled the, the grass seed uh, and the clover into it. And then following the direct drill, uh, it was rolled. And that was the, the full reseeding process in this field and the, the far field. Okay. And I suppose, look, we're standing here today. We're we're, we're into into the first week in October now, and we'd expect to see, um, some amount of clover left in the field at this stage. So, I suppose the results from the direct drilling, um, how did that work out for you in in regard to getting establishment of the the clover, Micah? Well, it was all very interesting because in the first four or five days, in the tracks left by the direct drill, we could see that the clover had shot, and was progressing very very well. Um, but at the same time, we also noticed that there was a, a, a vigorous growth of the old grasses. Uh, so we decided, uh, ha having had a discussion about it, the best thing to do was put sheep on it to try and keep the old grasses eaten down to a point, uh, and to a point where they wouldn't do any damage to the clover. As soon as the clover came on, then we had to take the sheep off it. Now they had eaten the grass back quite a bit, um, but uh, progressively the old grasses uh, came forward. The ground of course was very dry. We had uh, a couple of days rain uh, fairly shortly after the reseeding was completed so the growth conditions were phenomenal and the old grasses progressed very very rapidly. Uh, some of the newer grasses came along as well but we did become concerned that the clover was going to, to get smothered and as it turned out when it came to taking the cut of silage off it there was actually very little clover visible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So essentially you, you put in the sheep more or less after it was sold just to keep the, the, the old yes. grasses controlled until the clover emerged and then yes. and then remove the sheep then once exactly. you've seen the clover emerge. Yes. Yeah. And uh, today then as you can see uh, the grass having recovered after the second cut of silage, we did get a good cut of silage off it, but having recovered you can see that uh, there's, there's little or no clover in it. So it seems like the, the clover was overpowered by the older grasses uh, grown so vigorously and, and effectively smothering the clover. So I suppose uh, while while the direct drill um, might work very well in a conventional system where you can spray off with Roundup and, and I suppose remove the competition from the old grasses, it doesn't seem to have worked so well for you, Michael, here in an organic setting where you don't have the luxury of spraying off the old grasses. I'd say that's very much the case. Uh, now, you could argue that the, the growth was exceptional at the time, but nevertheless, in situations where I've seen the more traditional method used where the old grasses were burnt off, uh, then you could see that the clover could emerge without any competition and there was no great difficulty. But I think in the organic situation, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult to get clover established where there are old grasses there to compete with it. We're now standing in the, the field that was power harrowed for, for um, the establishment of the red clover. So can you just give us a, a background of exactly what happened in this field at so one time? Uh, yes, Cahal, the uh, silage was cut off us first week in June, very dry conditions. And um, then we decided we'd uh, power harrow it and we did three runs of the power harrow. Before that, I should have said we spread slurry 
uh, there was, I think a slurry went out on it. Then we did three uh, rounds of the power harrow uh, in very dry conditions. Uh, in fact, we were looking at it and saying that it might even have been an advantage if we had had one or two showers of rain just to dampen it down a little bit. But having said that, when the power harrowing process was finished, uh, th there was no vegetation left on it. The vegetation was completely cleared off it. And to look at it, you would, you would almost imagine that the vegetation had been killed off. So um, we then went in with a, a conventional um, uh, seed drill and uh, sowed the seed. And within five to six days, uh, we were able to see the, the clover beginning to uh, emerge. Okay, and in, in general, Michael, you'd be, you'd be very happy with the results in relation to the establishment of the red clover on this particular field? Yeah, from the beginning we could see that the clover had uh, a very good fighting chance. Now the conditions, the growing conditions were good. Uh, the rye grass as well uh, emerged and we could see that, that it was progressing. Um, and when it came to taking the cut of silage off it, it was quite clear that there was a very significant population of red clover in it. Um, we took the cut of silage off it, got a good crop off it, and as you can see now, it has recovered, and uh, still there, there's a, a very, uh, a very good and a very high population of red clover, and the growth rate is is vigorous both with the clover and also with the ryegrass. So it's a very, very successful outcome. Okay, and I suppose look at your, your as as you said, is there, there there's a nice uh, regrowth on it, and we're now in in the month of October here, so. Yes. I suppose, what's your plan, Michael, maybe for the, for the winter months? Do you intend to leave that cover on it or, or what uh, management w will you do on that over the winter? The, the plan now is we have uh, quite a lot of um, uh, late lambs uh, that would be in, in the region of about 30 kilos at the moment. And, and the idea is probably later on this week, we'll put those lambs on it and we'll try and finish them off on it between now and, and Christmas time. And uh, the, the hope is that economically that would proved to be a, a very good and economical method of finishing those type lambs and in addition to that it'll it'll keep the, the, the grass clean and keep it under control and not allow any any sort of mat of grass to grow over the winter period. Yeah. So I suppose the essential thing there is Michael that you're going in with, with, with light animals over the winter and not, and not heavier type maybe cattle or that, that, that'll cause damage to the ground and poaching and maybe damage your clover. Absolutely it's heavy ground as you can see and uh, no cattle wouldn't be an option no. Okay, yeah, Michael, so we're in the first of the, the three treatments that you use to sow the red clover. So can you just give us an idea? We're in the ploughed field here. So can you give us an idea of exactly what happened in this field prior to sowing? Uh, yes, Cahal, we um, took a cut of silage off it and uh, then we decided to plough it and till it in the, in the traditional way. Um, so uh, it, it was ploughed. It didn't get any um, farmyard manure or slurry. It was ploughed and uh, it was harrowed and then we um, sowed it with a conventional uh, seed drill and then after that it was rolled and um, in uh, now the conditions were very good it was june uh, the, the 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 ground was very very dry uh, we were rising dust it was exceptional uh, i suppose at this time of year uh, for this part of the country and there aren't that many opportunities that you might get to be able to plow uh, in the sort of land that we're talking about. But having said that, uh, in, in the overall scheme of things, I think that it would be no harm to always consider traditional ploughing in a rotational system for several reasons, uh, maybe to do with, with drainage and just opening up the soil. And um, from a results point of view, we can see that uh, the results are excellent. Uh, we have a very good crop of clover, very good crop of grass, and we got a a really good crop of uh, silage off it. Mm -hmm. So I suppose we're at the, the this the we're into October now. Um, after establishment, Michael, just maybe can you give us an idea of what what treatment it got in relation to wh when was it cut for silage and and did it get slurry or farmyard manure after you cut it for silage? It was cut uh, the second week in September, which was the 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 week of good weather that we had. Um, and uh, it has recovered extremely well since then, as you can see, a uh, very good uh, crop of clover, very good uh, recovery of the ryegrass. And our intention now is that from next week onwards, we will put lambs on it, store lambs, and we'll graze them on it probably up to the end of the year, depending on weather conditions. 
in order to um, keep the grass under control and as well as that we also want to test the the theory that this type crop will be suitable for finishing those sort of lands without any major concentrate input so from an economics point of view we'll be looking to see that it's economically viable to do that very good and just in relation to when it was cut had you a bit of slurry left in the tank that you could put on it after it was cut in september oh we did yeah i should have mentioned that we had slurry left and we, we it has got a coat of slurry yeah you're keeping the fertility up after after each cut of silage you're probably looking at putting a, a, a light coat of slurry on that's the idea and of course we'll have a, a, a an abundance of farmyard manure as well from the, the the wintering of the cattle in the sheds so that'll be there to go out on it too in the springtime yeah so you're despite the fact that you're probably going to be cutting we'll say three cuts of silage a year off this you are very much focusing on keeping the soil fertility up whether it's farmyard manure or yes. slurry that you're using absolutely Okay, and just at so on, um, um, Michael, would you would you have uh, spread lime on, on the three treatments at so on, or, or what was the treatment yes, there? We did indeed, and uh, I, I should have mentioned that earlier on. We did spread, we put out two and a half ton of lime. We did soil sampling, of course, before that, and discovered that uh, the pH needed to, some correction, so we put out two and a half ton of, of lime. Okay, so that and that was at so on, so it's, I suppose, very important, especially when you're so on either red or red or white clover to make sure that the lime is right and, and to sow, to put out lime at so on time. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, everybody. Um, that was a very good practical overview given there by Michael and uh, Cahill. Next up uh, for on our on our agenda this evening is our Chagas College uh, colleague, sorry, Lisa McGrain. Lisa, are you there? Yeah. Hello, Lisa. Lisa, just in, by way of introducing you before you get started is Lisa is based in Chagas in Sligo and before taking up position in Sligo Ch um, Lisa did her PhD project I just want to get the, the title right the addition of clover or herbs to a perennial ryegrass sward on animal and sward prefer uh, performance I suppose Lisa, what you're going to focus in since our topic tonight is about establishing red clover. Within that project, you did look at different methods of establishment through the ploughing, through disc harrowing, through power harrowing and through direct drilling. And I, you're going to give us an overview of what you found in your project in, in relation to that. And maybe you might give us a comment on uh, how lambs performed also. Yeah, no problem. So over to you, uh, Lisa. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks very much for the opportunity to to speak. So as um, as Elaine said, so I've carried out my uh, PhD um, in uh, Chagas in Nathan Rye. So um, for this project, we were looking at, um, you know, based on a sheep performance, um, a sheep performance uh, study, basically. Um, and so I'll just take you through the a few elements of the, the project, which might be relevant um, for you in relation to red clover. So um, for the basis of this project, we were comparing five sward types. So we were using perennial ryegrass as a control. And then we had clover treatments, which were perennial ryegrass and white clover, perennial ryegrass and red clover, um, perennial ryegrass and plantain, or perennial ryegrass and chicory, then the last two being herb treatments. So for the purpose of this, this evening, I suppose we'll try and focus on the perennial ryegrass and red clover sward. Um, I suppose just uh, to mention, I suppose that the focus of this trial was it was a grazing trial. So it wouldn't have been these red clover swords wouldn't have been sown with the intention of uh, for use in a silage system, as I suppose had been the focus for uh, Michael, for example. Um, and the other thing to note is that this project wouldn't have been um, in an organic system. So for this project, it would have been sown in a conventional system and, and would have received um, nitrogen, for example. So one of the uh, topics that we tried to investigate in relation to these sward types was establishment methods. So the different ways that you could sow, um, for example, in this case, um, a perennial ryegrass and red clover sward. So um, for that project, we had 60 uh, plots. They were grazed um, by sheep across the, across the season. They were sown in July 19 and measured for two and a half years. And I suppose the difference with, the, with this trial in comparison perhaps to what Michael would have spoken about previously is that being, you know, not being in organics uh, in this situation, we would have had the the use of, of Roundup or glyphosate to spray off those plots, um, which might, you know, I think that has a big bearing on the results that I'll be able to show you. 
So for the establishment methods, then we had four uh, methods that we used. And, um, you know, there are many methods available to, to farmers. But for this project, I suppose they, they vary in cultivation level. So we had the conventional, so like a full plow till and so um, full um, level of cultivation there. Then we had the disc where it was disc harrowed, followed by a power harrow treatment and so on after that. There was thirdly then the power harrow treatment. So it just got the power harrow and, and, and so on then. And lastly, then the direct drill. So with no a one pass system with, with no cultivation of the soil in that case. So if we look, I suppose, to some of the results from that trial. So this slide shows companion forage content or the, the proportion or the per percentage, I suppose, of clovers or herbs that were in those swords. And so if we look to the case in point, I suppose, perennial ryegrass and red clover, we see that there was no difference. So there was similar levels of red clover in all of those swords, irrespective of how it had been sown. So there was about uh, 12 to 15 percent red clover in all of those swords and it really didn't make very much difference there was no statistical significant uh, statistical uh, differences there um, in the amount of red clover that was in those swords and for me i suppose that was a positive because it would show that uh, you know farmers who who would like to sow um perennial ryegrass and red clover uh, swords you know would have the choice of methods and whatever it was that was available to them or their personal preference of what they would like to use for this project, we also measured unsown species or, or weeds uh, contents in those swords. And again, if we look to the perennial ryegrass and red clover sward that, that we're interested in this evening, we again see that there was no difference. So there was no statistical difference. There was about maybe between two and four percent um, unsown species or weed contents present in those swards. And it didn't make any statistical difference, you know, what established method you, you chose um, to, to sow it by, which again is a positive. Um, it would, you know, offer a choice, I suppose, to the farmer um, in that case. The second um, plot trial that we carried out was trying to investigate, I suppose, the effect of seeding rates when we were sowing those um, sward types. In this case, we had 72 plots. Again, they were grazed by, by sheep for the duration of the project, and they were again measured for two and a half years. So what we did here was there was a total seeding rate of 25 kilos per hectare used for all of the plots. And again, if we take uh, the perennial ryegrass and red clover sward um, for, for the, in, in this situation, I suppose we were sowing red clover at rates of two and a half, five or seven and a half kilos of red clover per hectare within that total 25 kilos per hectare seeding rate. So that works out to be around one, two or three kilos per acre uh, for those of you, I suppose, that would be more familiar with working in acres. Um, Again, I suppose it's important to notice that perhaps if you had intended to sow this sward for a red clover silage sward, you would be looking at at least that high seeding rate there of seven and a half kilos per hectare or, or perhaps above that again. But for the purpose of this project, it was sown, I suppose, as a grazing sward primarily. Again, we looked at, at the same companion forage content or how much red clover was there in that sward. And so when we look to the perennial ryegrass and red clover sward again, we see that, you know, there was a benefit of, of moving from the low to the medium and the medium to the high seeding rate. So there was a benefit of spreading that high rate of seven and a half kilos um, of red clover seed per hectare. And, you know, you were getting a return. There was more red clover seed establishing and persisting in that sward uh, by going to the high seeding rate, which which I suppose proves that the high seeding rate is necessary to, um, to establish a red clover sward in this way. So, for example, here, if you look to the left hand side, the perennial ryegrass and white clover sward, it actually made no difference. So that would suggest that the low rate was uh, that we used there of two and a half kilos per hectare, you know, might have been sufficient to establish white clover in that situation. There's many differences between white clover and red clover, and I suppose the ability of white clover to, to spread and to regenerate itself might have helped in this situation. So red clover wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have that ability to spread and, and reestablish itself in this world. Lastly, I suppose I wanted to mention, I suppose that Michael had mentioned um, finishing lambs um, on the red clover swords um, in the autumn period. And we did some work on this in Athenry as well, where we followed for four years, we followed the performance of yews and lambs grazing on the five different sward types. 
And what we saw, if we take it back to again to the relevance of red clover here, we saw that in the pre-weaning period, this was a, a mid-season lambing flock. Um, so in the pre-weaning period, uh, the lambs which were grazing on a perennial ryegrass and red clover sward were putting on 14 grams a day more than those grazing on a grass only sward. And then in the post weaning period, they were putting on 29 grams a day more than those grazing on a perennial ryegrass only sward. So over their lifetime, they were putting on 31 grams per day more than those grazing um, a perennial ryegrass only sward. So that would show, I suppose, that a red clover sward is a very beneficial um, or a very suitable sward, I suppose, for finishing lambs, particularly the advantages there that you can see in the post weaning period. Um, so what that meant really in the end up is that the graph shows um, percentage of lambs drafted, so dra draft and pattern across across the year, across the season. And we see that the red line there is the perennial ryegrass and red clover lambs. And we see that there's more perennial, higher proportion of perennial ryegrass and red clover lambs drafted all across the season. And so their days to slaughter was reduced by 20, 28 and a half days. So they were finished, gone from the farm 28 and a half days faster on average than a lamb that got a, a perennial ryegrass only sword, which is a huge difference on farm. Um, as is, I suppose, practice um, at a, com a commercial level, we would be trying as much as possible to uh, feed these lambs completely on pasture only uh, with no concentrates added to the diet up until usually around mid-October concentrates would be added to the diet of those lambs that are remaining on the trial at that point that hadn't reached their, their, their weight um, at that point. And because there was so uh, so many fewer uh, lambs remaining on that trial uh, in the group that were receiving uh, red clover swords, there was far fewer lambs there that required any concentrate feeding. And on average, uh, the concentrate feeding was reduced by 11.3 kilos per lamb drafted for the lambs on that red clover treatment in comparison to the perennial ryegrass only treatment. Lastly, I suppose one of the uh, last plot trials that we had carried out was trying to vary the post grazing sward height of the different um, the different sward types. And I just thought I'd give this a quick mention. So this uh, slide represents year three data. So after, you know, in the third year of having grazed that to three different sward heights. So grazing severely to four centimetres uh, in the med a medium of 4.75 centimetres or a lax uh, grazing treatment to five and a half centimetres. And what we saw was that after, you know, by, by year three, there was very low levels of red clover left in those swords if you graze them severely to four centimetres. So I suppose the take home message from that being that you know red clover swords are not suited to severe grazing um, and that's something to bear in mind I suppose uh, when you if you are using it to finish lambs or or other livestock I suppose in in the back end. So uh, I suppose a few take home messages uh, from the project were that in a conventional system the you know all of the methods of establishment that we tried out were sufficient the high uh, seed and rate treatment was beneficial and was needed. Um, there was very good levels of particularly post wean and lamb performance. Um, and so that would indicate that it was suitable for that lamb finishing system. And uh, that the last day, I suppose that it was uh, very important to be wary of your, your grazing severity um, for, for those trials and to not graze too severely, which will cause damage to the red clover plant. So thanks very much. Lisa, thank you very much. That was a great uh, snapshot of that. And definitely there is some points that we certainly can take on board, even though it wasn't done in an organic situation. Yeah. So again, any questions for Lisa, put them in the question and answer function. Okay, next for on my panel this evening is Michael Egan. Michael, how are you? Are you there? I am indeed. Okay, Michael, just by way, I just introduced you first to the, to the audience. Michael Egan is a researcher based in Moor Park, Chagas and Moor Park. And I suppose a lot of some of your research, maybe uh, Michael would focus on red clover establishment and how it contributes to the whole grassland swords. And I think this evening, Michael, you're going to give us an, an overview of a trial in Moor Park where you uh, part of the trial uh, was growing red clover under a zero nitrogen situation. And maybe also give us some from your experience then some agronomic advice around the around red clover yeah so thanks very much Elaine. Right? Can everyone see my screen okay is that coming up okay 
Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Work away. So, yeah, so I, I was going to have a, a a little bit of a background on 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 red clover, and we'll go through some of the pros and cons and the the growing factors around it to kind of tie in with what Michael and Kyle said earlier on in the video, and then Lisa in terms of some of her data as well. So I suppose one of the, the main things about red clover and white clover, and, and Lisa did touch on it, although a lot of her work was on, on grazing systems, red clover really is majority used for, for silage conservation because of the fact of the growing point on it. And, and Lisa touched on that when she highlighted that the persistence issues with grazing, and it's because of the growing point of red clover is located above the ground. And when we do graze it, there is a higher chance of damaging or removing that growing point through grazing. So it can be used in graze systems, but the persistency of it is much reduced. The big advantage of red clover is the nitrification, and, and some of the data would support that it can fix upwards of 350 kilos of nitrogen equivalent per hectare per year um, in, in very good systems are typically around 200 to 250 kilos. Um, and because of that, it gives high herbage, high sward quality and high silage quality to increase overall animal performance. So in terms of the pros and the cons, and I suppose this is where we're getting down to in it, and there are a lot of pros with it, but there also seems to be some things we need to keep in mind in terms of the negatives associated with red clover. I suppose the main pros that are associated with it is the, the, the nitrification, and that is the key advantage of red clover, the high level of nitrification through biologic nitrification that we can get from it. As a result, we can get high levels of dry matter production with some data later on to show that we can get in excess of 15 ton with zero or extremely low levels of chemical fertilizer. And in terms of the animal performance side of you, Lisa, I touched on that in terms of the higher intakes, higher weight gains or higher milk production. Some of the cons is the, the lack of persistency around grazing, particularly with larger stock or on heavier soil types because of the damaging the plant itself, the growing point. Uh, low levels of persistency. On average, you can get swords that will last quite long in, in the system if they're well managed and good soil fertility, but typically they have a lower persistence uh, in the overall system compared to uh, white clover or other uh, or, or ryegrass. There is an issue with um, disease buildup in the soil. Now, a lot of this work is extremely old and there isn't a, a huge amount of more recent data supporting this, but it, it would suggest that if we if you are sowing it in a rotation, you need a three to four year break um, before going from red clover to red clover. Uh, and that's just to, to break that cycle of the, the disease buildup in the soil. And particularly as we get later on in the year, if we are making into silage or conservation uh, and we get wet weather because of its lower dry matter, it can be difficult to ensoil to get that dry matter content high enough when we are trying to sow it or to... to, to um, to cut it and, and 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 cut it in. So it does need a, a longer wilting time, but in, in poor weather conditions, particularly later on in the year, it can be difficult. Uh, around the establishment, and this is what we're looking at now, I suppose, around the establishment, unfortunately at the moment in the Republic of Ireland, there is no recommended list for red clover varieties as there is with ryegrass and white clover. There are talks of having a list coming out in the next couple of years for in the Irish uh, Irish list. The closest one we have is the UK recommended list. Um, and I suppose what they are broken down into is tetraploids and diploids. And, and I have more slides later on in this. But if you look here on the right hand side of that little table, you can see the variety diploids and tetraploids. Um, and similar to um, ryegrass, tetraploids and diploids, it is a difference in the growth habit of it in terms of the height or the width of the plant growing. Uh, seeding rates, I, I'm not going to go over that. Lisa covered that. And then the, the growing and rotation with the four year break. If we look at actually the, the red clover crop itself versus the white clover crop, and Lisa mentioned that white clover has a has a ability to, to grow outward along the ground and fill in a lot of the empty bare patches that can be left by the ryegrass. And, and that is because of its solar nifus growth habit there that you can see the white right clover plant on the right hand side grows along the ground and puts up a load of individual plants coming from that stolen or solar nifus growth habit. However, when we have red clover here on the left hand side of this graph, it is a central tap root. And out of that central tap root, we have uh, multiple uh, stems and leaves coming out of that. Um, but if we look at this here, just typically at the ground level, just at the, where the where it changes from the roots into the plant, that is where the growing point is located on the plant. And because ryegrass tillers out, uh, white clover has new stolons, red clover doesn't. So the single plant of red clover that is there is going to be the red clover plant that will be there long term. And if that tap root or crown of the, the plant is damaged through overgrazing, hugging or poaching, compaction or overcutting, 
um, it will kill that plant and that is due and that is why in poorly managed sports persistence can be an issue and that is something that needs to be bear in mind depending on what system you're putting in if it's going to be all silage grazing and silage or just grazing the persistency is going to reduce the more frequent grazing and intensive grazing that we have in place on that and that's why it is more suited to a, a silage system um, and in terms of the the compaction issue, and I, I think a, a question came up in the in the question and session there on the compaction and heavier heavier land type. This is just a, a picture from some of the the red clover swards in Grange that are currently entering their fourth or fifth year. I think it's entering their fifth year now at this stage. And you can see this is the gate of the plat of the of the paddock here on the bottom on the top right hand corner of that picture, and across the two headlands and the middle of the paddock where most of that driving uh, taking place when it's being cut, all of the red clover is gone in those areas. And that is due to the compaction issue that is there with white with red clover and driving on that and damaging the crown of the plant. So we need to be, be bear very much in mind, particularly on soil types and the, the location of gates and gaps and we're driving across those paddocks that we are going to do excessive damage to that plant in those locations and it will reduce the persistency of it. And the heavier the soil type is, the more of an issue that is pronounced because particularly when you get into that third uh, cutting in autumn, if you have heavy weather or wet weather like we did this year, you can do a lot of damage in compaction and damaging that crown or the, the growing point on the plant. And you can be left up with, a, with a, a sward or a field like this. So it's just something to bear in mind that when you are cutting it, that you compaction around gates and headlands, if they can be concentrated to a small area of the paddock, rather than the contractors or, or balers or the farmer drive, and particularly with slurry as well, driving across uh, large areas of the field and spreading that out, it is probably better to keep it to small localised areas rather than doing a lot of a little bit of damage across a lot of the paddock, if that makes sense. In terms of the management in a multi-cut system, so look, we're, we're typically looking at in a silage system, a three to four cut pro cutting protocol from early to mid-May, the first cut should be taken. If we're trying to get a four cut system, uh, we should be going early May. Uh, frequent cutting of every six to eight weeks um, with a wilt of up to 36 to 48 hours, depending on thing, what we're trying to do is get a dry matter content of close to 30% when in soiling, not a cutting when in soiling. Um, obviously, this is an organic webinar, but again, avoiding chemical nitrogen application. Two reasons. It reduces the level of clover content in the swards. It will reduce overall nitrogen fixation later on in the year um, and can reduce the persistency of it as well. That is high levels of chemical fertilizer and not going to be an issue for this audience today. But I think in the wider circumstance of it, a lot of red clover has been in the last number of years. There can be issues with applying high levels of chemical fertilizer when it's not really needed. And what do I mean by what, what is not really needed is if we look at some of the work here from, from Chagas years ago uh, and Northern Ireland, if we look at uh, perennial ryegrass getting um, and, red, and red clover getting zero levels of chemical fertilizer off across a four cut system, it's growing 15.7 tonne of dry matter per hectare. Uh, and we have a ryegrass only system across a, a similar four cut silage system with 400 kilos of chemical fertilizer per hectare, again, growing the exact same level of tonnage. So there is huge ability of red clover swords to fix high levels of, of nitrogen fixation and to have high levels of dry matter production from that under no levels of chemical fertilizer. In terms of the clover content, and, and this is work again from, from Chagas Grange and Park again, looking at the level of clover that's in those swards. And if we look at the, the clover proportion of the red clover content across the, the months of those years, and again, on a tree-cut silage system, most of the red clover, and, and in turn, the nitrification ability of that is located in kind of from June onwards after that first cutting is taken. And that's why it's important as much as possible or as early as possible to take that first cutting so we can get a higher level of, of red clover coming back into the sward. Um more of it in it and a higher level of nitrogen fixation for the second and subsequent cuts there afterwards. So that first cutting, delaying it until early June, uh, can have detrimental effects on the clover content, nitrogen fixation, and overall long-term persistence of that red clover in the sward uh, later on. So it should be taken in that first two-week period of May, that first cut, and then you're on a six to eight week cutting protocol afterwards. And again, with this, uh, in a tree cut system, we're growing in excess of 19 or 18 tonne of dry matter per hectare. Uh, in a two, this is in a three year old sward, uh, with again, with no levels of chemical fertilizer, just uh, slurry going back out onto this sward. 
In terms of cultivars, again, I said there is no Irish recommended list. This is work that we've just started in Moorpark and Grange with a student of mine, um, Sinead Kearney, looking at the role of red clover cultivars and what they are going to do in the overall system. Um, and there is a variation between cultivars. And that is the key thing to look at here. If we look at it on a four cut silage system going on the, the UK recommended list. Uh, from left to right here, there is a clear decline in overall dry matter production and spore clover content in the red line across the top of it here with some cultivars over others. So it is important that when you are looking at sowing these cultivars or red clover in your systems, you want to get the best bang for your book when you are receding it. So selecting cultivars from the left-hand side of this graph here versus the right-hand side is going to increase overall dry matter production, nitrogen fixation, clover content and overall feed, feed quality of that system um, as well. So that is all I kind of have to say, Elaine, if I know it's very quick, but I think if there's more questions, probably better rather than me talking for the next 20 minutes. That's okay, Mike, that was very good. Uh, whistle stop to were there. Thank you very much. Maybe I will ask everybody to, all, everybody to switch on their cameras. And I'll, as I say, get people their questions are coming in so maybe as the questions come in i might have a couple of questions myself for for you maybe call there uh call you what happened post october there on on uh, um michael's field just to update people yeah. so um as i think michael probably covered in the video but uh, um once the once the um the final cut of silage was taken it it, it got a coat of slurry and um, after the regrowth, then he grazed lambs on it from from October to after Christmas. Um, now, probably one of the mistakes that Michael might have made was that you know the lambs that he selected to put onto it were probably slightly too light at the time. So, um, anyone trying to finish lambs off red clover, probably the advice would be that you know thirty five kilos plus, um, in it in order to enable yourself to finish those lambs off the red clover, as opposed to maybe going in with lighter thirty kilo lambs. And maybe only getting them to 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 the forty kilo mark. Okay, okay, Lisa. Just when you were talking there on the lamb performance uh, and showing that on red clover lambs were performing very well, but you did say something there about severe grazing. So when you were doing that, how how far did you graze it to, or what way did you manage that so that you didn't have that you minimised the impact of the severity of your grazing? Yeah, so I suppose from the initial study that we were looking at lamb performance, we had tried to just see, like I suppose the question was really, would the perennial ryegrass and red clover sport suit in the under the current management that you'd be advising mm. for for ryegrass only? So would we would have been generally grazing with, down till about four and a half centimeters uh, for that study, um, and then we we took it on then to the the um, investigating the three different heights in a plot study to see. Mm. That's what, so I suppose to prove, uh, you know, would would heights make a difference? And and what we would see there is that that severe grazing to four centimeters is is too severe. It has a negative impact on red clover and the the plant persistency as you would have expected. Um, but even if you, I think it was interesting to see the difference between four and four point seven five centimeters because that's a very small difference. But even that small difference, you know, helped to to prolong the the life. I suppose the lifespan of that red clover. Okay, and just I'm going backwards, but then at the start, when you were talking about your establishing techniques, really what you're saying is that you saw no difference. Maybe the fact I just noticed it was only over two years, a kind of crystal ball gazing. Do you think if you, you if you had carried it out for another trial for another couple of years, you would see a difference? Or would that be quite a definitive answer that you got in the study? I think when you're looking at the effective establishment method that you would probably have expected any results that you were going to see to have appeared, you know, sort of straight away or, you know, definitely by the, by that two and a half years would, I would imagine would, you wouldn't expect to see the differences in methods appear and after that time period. Okay, okay. Michael, just something that struck me and it's a question that we get a lot of times. In your experience of sowing red clover, and if you're sowing it for a red clover silage sward, what's the optimum date to start to sow that crop when you want to get it into the ground? Yeah, like ideally, all of what we've done, and, and Lisa probably can come in on this too, but like all of what we've done on, on sowing, you're, you're getting the best return in a spring reseed, and I saw a spring reseed April in, into May and late May. 
Um, when we go later than that, okay, this was a wet summer, but we can get, if we go into July and August, uh, we can get very dry weather uh, and can hinder establishment as well. Um, so yeah, spring is the best time. And the real issue with autumn reseeding, particularly around September, early, late autumn, early September, is the chance of getting wet weather in the back end. Uh, which is number one going to reduce the establishment counts of the plants that we've seen and number two is going to really hinder any sort of post defoliation management thereafter because it's going to do too much damage to the plant so all the work we've done on, on sowing dates in, in Moorpark with white clover, red clover, ryegrass spring is the optimal time um, and when you have a legume included in that it's even more important to go to an earlier sowing date in the spring rather than autumn if we want to get high enough clover counts in the, as red clover doesn't tiller out, red, white clover does and ryegrass does, as red clover doesn't tiller out, mm -hmm. if we go too late of sowing and we hinder the establishment counts day one, we'll never make up that difference. So that's why it's really important, particularly with red clover, to do a spring, early summer reseed um, versus an autumn. And I think when we go to an autumn with the cost of reseeding that's there, it is probably a not a waste of money, but you're really going to hinder the long-term performance of that sport. And maybe just speaking there on the performance, just something else that you touched on there, this whole area of a fourth cut. Yeah. In relation to a fourth cut, that's a question we would get asked. With the autumn's getting so much milder, there's a there's a growth of a crop there. How, how can you do it successfully and is it worth it? In so in, in terms of a plant point of view, uh, whatever about the, it being worth it. But in terms of a plant point of view, carrying an excessively heavy cover over the winter and into spring mm. is going to cause detrimental effects because of reducing light and increasing shading in the base of the sward, which is going to reduce the ryegrass tillering and also lift up the growing. So if we have the growing point of the red clover that is quite low to the ground, and we want to keep or the red clover, sorry, mm. and we want to keep it as low as possible mm. to the ground. If we carry a heavy cover on that over the winter and into spring, what's going to happen is because of the increased shading, it is going to cause uh, that's that growing point to lift up in the base of the sward. And then when we do take the first cut off it the following spring or early summer, we have a, a higher chance of removing that growing point. So from a plant point of view, it is definitely worth it if there is an excessively heavy cover of grass carried into that from October onwards. Yeah. The risk is, back to that picture yeah. that I showed, is the compaction damage that can be caused in that time of the year. So it, it's very difficult to get it right. I, I would say... Getting mm -hmm. your third cut too early is probably the biggest factor in then having that fourth cut. Because if we have that third cut that's too early, we're then going to have a high level of herbage or mass built up on that coming into the late autumn, early winter. So I think it's probably slightly delaying that third cut if we're in a wet area. If you're in a dry area, there's not much of an issue. But if you're in a wet area of the country, you are going to have issues with that third cut on the compaction point of view, number one. And number two, getting a dry enough weather to be able to ensoil it without having any spoiling or, or effects from it. So it's a balance and it's what you have yeah, yeah. Look, it, that you have to work with. Yeah. I'd love to say we're going to get a dry, dry yeah. October and we can go and cut no. it. The chances <laughs> are very difficult. And I think it's getting yeah. that balance right. Yes, that, yes. And, and I think I was looking at you there, someone asked a question about mulching it. Uh, in the autumn just on the questions that are coming in yes like mulchers are very severe on the ground um, and I think even in the video Michael said he mulched it and it left it with nothing uh, and if you mulch a sward to to allow light down into it over the winter the chances are you're going to do a lot of damage to the crown of the plant as well and remove it and that'll have more of a detrimental mm -hmm. effect long term so if it's extremely wet and you're going to do a lot of damage to the paddock I would leave it and try and take that first cut earlier in the spring. Yes. Um, if you have a good autumn and a and a dry October, not like last year, I would chance it and try and cut it in and out. And first cut in spring, what do you mean by that, Michael? When is first cut in spring? Yeah, sorry, sorry spring, when early summer. So early I, I think, cut it. yeah, so I, I think that first cut to get, because of the, the clover contents on it, and we want to get, increase the clover content and increase nitrogen fixation. If we delay that first cut into June, you're going to, that has a detrimental effect on the clover content and the clover recovering on that sward there afterwards. Yeah. So the first cutting on a red, and also, well, definitely on soil, on red clover soil swords should be taking in that first two week window in May. There might be a lower dry matter yield of it, but you will make up the difference in the, in the second and third cuts. Okay. 
okay, Michael. Okay, uh, maybe uh, Carl. Moving on to you again, there was a question came in here. Uh, did Ma Michael manage to finish the lambs off the red clover without meal? Um, so I suppose essentially from from the October to the Christmas time, he managed to put on somewhere between 10 and 12 kilos onto the lambs. So as I said, them 30 kilo lambs um, didn't fully finish off it. Whereas anything over sort of 35 plus, he managed to get finished off it in a way. So as I said, it's it's just try to get the, the lambs up to up to a minimum of 35 kilos before you put them in on the red clover because or else have more red clover for them. But it's going to take um, probably an extra month or six weeks to finish them lambs, um, them lighter lambs off it as opposed to a 35 plus kilo lamb. Okay, okay, Carl. Lisa, question in here for you. Um, Lisa, would you recommend if there was weeds in the field, uh, what would you recommend if there was weeds in the field before sowing? Yeah, I suppose uh, in our situation when we weren't you know, in our, yeah. in an organic situation, we would always be recommending basically, and for any, same as any reseed, is to try and deal with whatever weed problem, weed devastation is there before you go in to sow your new crop into it. But I suppose, yeah, that's obviously going to be more difficult in an organic situation if you can't use the, the more conventional forms of, of, of weed, dealing with the weed problem that might be there um, from a start off, I suppose. I okay, and there's another comment on that, Elaine. Comment there, Carl. Yep. Um, just for for Work for an in an organic situation, if if there is um a problem with weeds in the field or paddock before you before you go reseeding, you probably need to make the decision to plow it. Yeah, um, it's fair. it's going to give you the best chance of suppressing the weeds to give your to give your sward a chance to get to get established. If you go with with um power her on an over so and them weeds are going to just come back every bit as quick as 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 your your grass so i would say if you have a weed problem you need to plow okay 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 and maybe just lisa another one any comment maybe on including white clover with the red clover and mix with a view to the persistence of the sword yeah, so there's no reason that you can't put the two in together. Um, I suppose the difficulty comes with the fact that maybe what the management that suits one doesn't necessarily suit another. For a grazing situation, look, I'd be thinking myself that if you had both in, in um, you know, be aware or be, you know, acknowledge the fact that the red clover uh, isn't going to last as long in, in a grazing situation. So, you know, put in both, make the most use of the red clover, you know, um, get the most performance out of it, prioritize the animals that you're putting on there and acknowledge the fact that, you know, if you continue to graze it in that, ma you know, in that manner, it won't last as long. But hopefully, you know, when the red clover has died out of that sward, you should still have a good grass and white clover sward uh, to continue on with. That would be, I suppose, my take on it anyway um from a silage perspective i suppose the white clover if you're keeping it for silage swords that you know keeping heavy covers um and and that preventing the light from traveling down to the soil will damage you know the persistency of the white clover in that situation that's where i suppose red clover is more suited in, in that case Okay, uh, Michael, a question for you. Um, is there any method of over sowing the bare patches when the red clover is declining? Yeah, so there's, there's obviously methods for over sowing plants, um, but the issue is the success of over sowing red clover. Um, so there's good success with over sowing ryegrass and white clover. Um, we've done it in Moorpark, Lisa has done it in Grange with Philip as well, and, and that works quite well. However, and Michael said in his video too, because red clover is a different plant and the way it grows, um, and they're typically in silage swords. The success of over sowing a red clover sward into a silage sward is extremely difficult um, because you're trying to get the balance right with keeping short plants or short um, grass height, uh, cutting it for silage and not damaging the plant as well. So not that it can't be done, but it's extremely difficult. And typically the areas that are... Um, that the clover has died out in those patches, like that picture I showed, are severely compacted. So even if the plant does germinate, it's going to get very difficult to push its taproot down into the ground because of the areas of high areas of compaction. So it can be done not very successfully and it's extremely different. There's a lot more success with over sowing white clover or ryegrass into swords than there is with red clover. And maybe just following on that, Michael, 
question here. When establishing red clover, does the plant need to be allowed to flower before cutting for the first time? Yeah, so there's a lot of talk about it has to flower before mm. cutting and it has to flower within at least once a year thereafter as well. There is no scientific evidence to suggest, I'm not saying that you do or don't, but there is no scientific evidence anywhere in the world to suggest that it will increase the persistency of spores with that have flowered or not flowered. Um, the, the, the biggest thing of, of persistency is soil fertility, um, compaction, and then tap root or crown root, growing point protection. So the, the the flowering, the plants will always flower. Typically on the second cut, you're not going to get a high level of flowering on the first cut because of the timing. You'll typically get a high percentage of your plants flowering in the second cut, but there isn't really any evidence to suggest that it has to flower to maintain high levels of persistency. It's more of a kind of a... Okay. A, not rubbishing anything, but it's more of a kind of an old wives tale than actual scientific evidence. Okay, okay. That answers that, Mike. Thank you. Now, um, Lisa, just a specific question here in relation to one of the mixes you show with the mix with chicory in it ton. Did the lambs do better on how much fertilizer was uh, was applied to keep the ryegrass going? Can you remember? Is that very specific? Can yeah. So um, for for the the lamb performance from perennial ryegrass and red clover or perennial ryegrass and chicory, those were the groups with the highest animal performance, the highest levels of, of lamb performance. And they would be in very similar levels, actually, very similar reductions in days to slaughter um, with those two sward types compared to the grass only. For the purpose of this trial, we were spreading uh, 130 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. And we kept that the same across the board. Board. The one thing I would find maybe, and, and as as obviously as Mike has suggested as well, is that you know you probably you could have reduced the nitrogen on those, particularly on those clover swords, because of the ability of the clovers to produce nitrogen in the soil. But for the herb treatments where plantain or chicory are included, you know they still they can't produce nitrogen uh, the same as clovers can, and so therefore they will require an application of nitrogen uh, similar to I suppose to ryegrass. Okay, maybe just a specific question here in relation to the P and K required for uh, for red clover. Maybe your Michael or, or Lisa might comment on it. Is there a minimum P and K indices that you can get that that you can have that you will still be able to establish red clover, or is P and K critical to the establishment? Yeah, I might go first, Lisa, and then you can come in after if you want to. Yeah, so yeah, so I, I think soil fertility in any legume, because of the nature of its plant, uh, is extremely important. And if you have below index three indices for the establishment, number one, you're going to hinder establishment uh, and then reduce taproot formation as well, and which reduce overall long-term persistence. So to, to try and establish red clover or white clover in swords that have below optimum soil fertility, you're going to reduce establishment rates and long-term persistence. Um, that's number one in the establishment, but then actually in the in the plant requirements, long-term going forward as well. If we have a silage red clover sward uh, that is growing in excess of 14, 15 tonne of dry matter per hectare, that equates to somewhere around four kilos of P per one tonne of dry matter and about 30 kilos of K per one tonne of dry matter. So if you have a sward that is producing, I'm going to get my phone now, sorry. But if you have a sward that is producing uh, 14 ton, which is a is a, a reasonable average um, figure, uh, 14 ton at 30 kilos of K, that is 420 kilos of K required to maintain that plant growth um, long term and the soil indexes within that. And that's if you're in index three and index four maintenance on top of that or build up on top of that is required if you're below that um like if you look at a typical thousand gallons of slurry you're talking between 30 and, and 40 kilos of k per or units of k per 1000 gallons so that is uh you're talking a lot of slurry or and farmyard manure to make up that difference uh in it so it is extremely important p and k within that particularly in a fully silage system because you're taking there's no recycling in it really rough figures okay. in in an organic system michael is is you're sort of talking nearly 3000 gallons after each after each cut and maybe a a, a bit of farmyard manure in, in in the back end of the year yeah, as well so i think the farmyard manure in the back end really to to build up indexes over the soil and then for your each cut there afterwards then you're talking two and a half to 3000 gallons the typical 3000 gallons of slurry on average these are book values you're talking about 90 to 100 units or kilos of k 
per 3,000 gallons being applied per, per acre. So that and that is a high slurry requirement. And in all ways, um, you might not have that slurry capacity or volume on farm to meet that requirement. So on, on the overall farm, so if you want to really to get the best out of the red clover uh, and, and high yields and long-term persistence, you're probably keeping that slurry targeted more towards those red clover silage sports while the red clover is in it. And then obviously soil okay, pH, um... a minimum soil pH of 6.5. I should have said that as well. That is essential for root nodulation, which is essential for bi biological nitrofixation. So if we don't have a soil pH of 6.5, we're going to reduce nitrofixation as well. Just, just a couple more questions. I'm conscious we're nearly finished, uh, um, but there's a couple of questions just coming here. I just throw them out to you. This, uh, to take a heavy grass cover off a red uh, clover crop post winter, could you zero graze at a five centimeter height and uh, now to give the sward a better chance to come May to harvest crop? What's maybe Michael? Yeah, so you can Lisa? zero graze again. The issue with the zero grazer is the the compaction lines. Uh, again in it and I've seen a field in, in outside Coolmore in Tipperary that was zero grazed one autumn in the second year of sowing and the following year there was uh, no clover, clover, no clover, clover all along the tracks of the zero grazer effort because you're driving in such a concentrated area so close to each other and each line has been driven on by the tractor and then the the zero grazer the next time as well so it can work to remove the herbage make sure you're not cutting too low um, but just Possibly, if you're doing it every year, just try and avoid wet weather. Again, back to that compaction issues with it. And if it has been cut multiple times that year as well, there's also probably a small little compaction that has happened there. It might be best to alter the cutting direction. That's actually mentioned. There's someone in the chat as well about um, cutting. So like it would be mentioned previously, I suppose, in the same way that we would be saying that the severe post graze and sward height is having a negative impact, that you would have the option, I suppose, to maybe put up the more a, a small bit to try and um, alleviate that issue as well. Would you agree with that, Mike? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. So I, I think exactly. I think Lisa it's probably said it a lot shorter than I would. <laughs> Okay, folks, I'm just conscious of the time and we, uh, it's, we've it's we ran out of time. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much, Cahal, Lisa and Michael, for your time. I think we've got a very good practical overview as well as the science behind it also. I think we all know a little bit more about red clover, but from what I'm taking from this webinar is there's a lot to know about red clover. So uh, do your homework on it. But certainly it has a, a lot of potential and especially in an organic system where we can't have uh, use nitrogen and we need some high protein to feed our animals. So thank you very much to you all. Um, before I go, I want to give a shout out for our next webinar, which is taking place on the 6th of March. And we're, we're changing the focus completely and we're going to look at experiences with crops for field scale organic vegetable production and on the night we will be joined by William DC um, Chagas Horticulture Advisor and also we have a guest uh, Christoph Den Hurd who is a Senior Advisor in Organic Vegetables with Ceres so that's on, on the date for the diaries Wednesday the 6th of March at 7pm and without and further ado Yes, Carl, did you want to say something? Just, um, I just want to let the audience know that there will be a farm walk this summer on, on Michael and Anne Edwards' farm in, in, in County Leitrim. Just So keep an eye out for that coming up in probably in July time. So just if anyone is interested in hearing more about red clover, there will be a walk there in, in the summertime. Okay, Carl, that's another date for your diary. So without further ado... I say, bid you all good night, stay, stay safe. And for anybody that's interested in horticulture, do join us again then on the 6th of March. Thank you, everybody, and good night.